Good evening. My name is Brianna Hindle and I am representing the Mures Students Association. It is my pleasure to welcome you all to the 23rd Muresk Lecture. The event commenced in 1981 by the Muresk Students Association to bring the high profile people to speak to topical agriculture and agribusiness issues and to share their university experience of lectures of, with all Muresk students, industry and the community. It is now my pleasure to introduce the Honourable Christian Porter, MP, um, Federal Member for Parliament for PS in the House of Representatives and Parliamentary Secretary to the Prime Minister of Australia. Ladies and gentlemen, perhaps if I just commence with formal acknowledgements, which are to Mr Neil McCauley, thank you, uh, Acting Managing Director of the C.Y. O'Connor Institute, uh, Professor Christine Storer, the Head of the School of Agribusiness at the C.Y. O'Connor Institute, and Mr Tim West, Dean of Science from Charles Sturt University. If I might also acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land that we're meeting on, and Deborah, thank you very much for that very warm welcome to country. To Brianna and Rachel, thank you, and to the Student Association. Um, it really is, I think, a significant achievement for a student association, indeed for anyone, to organise uh, these annual lectures, which are a very important lecture on the circuit of academic lectures in Western Australia. Uh, when I was at university, student organisations uh, did organise things, but just nothing important. So uh, well done to you. Um, uh, I've had a um, day which started at 4am in Brisbane, and I've had meetings in Brisbane, um, Canberra, Melbourne and Perth, which has brought me here to you tonight. And I must say that having visited all those cities, it, it is something that I can say to you with all honesty, that there is nothing in Australia quite as beautiful as what you, surrounds you here tonight. I mean, it is actually quite amazing. Um, and I've also been very grateful to have had the full experience uh, here at Muresk because you allowed me to have a dorm room and have a shower and change clothes. So thanks. I feel like I understand. Here, Rachel, can you catch that? There you go. That's yours. <laughs> Um, and that brings me to this evening's lecture. Um, it is truly a great pleasure to give this lecture. I know it was given by the Premier uh, last year, so I hope that you'll bear with me this year. Um, I have experienced uh, professional work as a politician, uh, as a lawyer and as an economist, and those are three professions that often attract some level of frustration from the community. Uh, people find that they often disagree with politicians, uh, people seem to find lawyers just plain disagreeable most of the time. Uh, but what people find most frustrating, I think, is economists, because um, economists can never seem to agree even amongst themselves. You know, if economics is a science, then why is it that economists can't agree on important foundational basic principles in their science like physical scientists can? Uh, the lawyer and the politician jokes, which I hear very often, are always hilarious and very funny, but they're never as funny to me as the um, jibes about economists. And I recently heard a description of an economist that goes, a scientist is someone who develops a theory and tests whether it will work in practice. An economist sees something work in practice and then spends the rest of their life wondering whether or not they can make it work in theory. Um, and perhaps the greatest example of that sort of criticism came from a very famous mathematician and, in fact, the, um, the inventor, if you like, of the thermonuclear weapon, uh, Stanislaw Ulam was his name. And in 1969, Stanislaw Ulam famously challenged the Nobel laureate economist, the American Paul Samuelson, to come up with one economic theory that was both true and non-trivial. So that was both true and important. Just one. Now, I've done a lot of cross-examination as a lawyer in my life, and I don't think I've ever heard a more devastating question in cross-examination. Um, if you could not find one single theory in your own profession of economics that was both important and upon which everyone in your profession could agree, that is a devastating criticism of your profession, the profession of economics. Now, it took Samuelson several years to give an answer to that question. But eventually, several years later, after 1969, Samuelson responded with, a, with an answer that was equally as devastating the, as the question was itself. And Samuelson's answer to Ulam's question, name me something that in economics which is non-trivial and, and provable and true, 
Samuelson's answer was David Ricardo's 1817 theory of comparative advantage of trade. And the principle in Ricardo's 1817 book, Principles of Political Economy and Taxation, is simple. It is undeniably and provably true, and it is of colossal importance. For Australia, and I think that this lecture is designed for your students here, uh, for Australia and for your future, our future as a nation, as a successful exporter, is going to be the single most important issue for your lives and for the lives of your children. And speaking tonight in the Wheat Belt, we are in the trading heart of a trading state, and so I can safely say to you that there is no more important issue that is presently facing our nation right here and now than the debate that is raging around the China-Australia Free Trade Agreement, which some people call CHAFTA, which is a terrible name. I'll just call it tonight the China FTA. So the, the subject I've chosen for this evening, of, uh, the subject of this Muresque lecture, is to speak tonight about the China Free Trade Agreement. And to anticipate the conclusion of this lecture, I want to put to you tonight a very simple proposition, that the China Free Trade Agreement is both incredibly important to Australia and massively positive for Australia, and that this proposition is just as provable as the beneficial truth of the original theory of free trade of David Ricardo that inspired the agreement that we're now talking about this evening. And to prove the immense benefits of the China Free Trade Agreement, the presentation tonight is going to look at three things. What does the China FTA not do? What does it not do? What does the China FTA actually do? And what would be the consequences if at this very late hour the China FTA came undone? Three things. So to start off with, what does the China FTA not do? Many of you now would have seen claims about the China FTA that are being made and aired in a very large union-funded advertising campaign. To coarsely summarise those claims here tonight, they are that the FTA will lead to large numbers of dangerously unskilled Chinese workers coming to Australia and taking jobs that would otherwise go to local workers. Now, this is a very well-funded... Uh, very well organised and orchestrated campaign. It is being directly supported by many, but thankfully not all, thankfully not all members of the Labor Party. The Electrical Trade Union has run what are known as robocalls, automatic calls into households in targeted electorates around Australia. You pick up the phone and a recorded message tells you that the China FTA will allow unqualified electricians to work in Australia and put the safety of you and your family at risk. Now, the great Winston Churchill once said that a simple lie is halfway around the world before a complicated truth has had the chance to put its pants on. And um, I, I think that is very true in modern politics. And the scare campaign that is being now run on the China FTA, like all very good scare campaigns, takes small issues out of their overall factual context and it then constructs a simple lie around that misrepresentation. Unfortunately, uh, the only way to combat simple lies is with more complicated truths. So to commence with, what I wanted to do in this lecture is test three central claims that are part of this scare campaign. Scary, scary claim number one, that Chinese workers will take jobs that would otherwise go to local workers. This claim relates to what are, in truth, very small changes to the application of what is known as labour market testing and a small change to the threshold of projects that will become subject to what are known as Infrastructure Facilitation Agreements, or IFAs. So firstly, labour market testing, which is essentially just a requirement that firms who um, employ 457 visa labour advertise jobs first. The China FTA is the same as our previous FTAs in, in that it's consistent with our undertakings to the World Trade Organisation. That is to allow foreign companies to bring in corporate executives and managers on a temporary basis, which makes logical sense. So in all of our previous free trade agreements, including those signed by the Labor Party, which they negotiated well and brought to completion well, Australia has made a commitment to exempt from labor market testing, from advertising if you like, certain individuals applying for temporary entry work visas. 
Those individuals are business executives who are intra-corporate transferees, so that are, that are traded inside the corporation in question, senior managers as intra-corporate transferees, independent executives, and certain skilled workers who are defined narrowly as either specialists or contractual service suppliers. Applications for temporary entry in these categories is managed under the 457 sponsor process, the visa sponsor process that you would have all heard of. So under the China FTA, all of that remains as it has done for decades. But there are two minor modifications. First, there is proposed to be an additional category of people who will be exempted from labour market testing, from the advertising, and they are known as installers and services. Someone is an installer and a servicer where the installation and or servicing of equipment by the supplying company in question is a condition of purchase of the said machinery equipment. So the people who sell the equipment to the company say it can only be worked on by people that we've approved as specified and qualified to work on that equipment to protect their reputation and protect the equipment. An installer or servicer must abide by Australian workplace standards and conditions. They cannot perform services which are not related to the installation or servicing of the uh, machinery in question. And importantly, those workers already have access under Australia's temporary work short stay activity 400 visa system. And, and the FTA commitment does not change that. Now, as well as that very limited extension to the people who can come in um, on top of business executives and senior managers, these installers and services, there's another change. And that is that there's been a commitment to extend to four other China-specific occupations, uh, but only up to a total of 1,800 people, 1,800 people. And that is it will apply to Chinese chefs, traditional Chinese medicine practitioners, and Mandarin language teachers and Chinese martial arts trainers. A very similar commitment was made with respect to um, Thai chefs under the recent FTA uh, finalised with Thailand. So, a limit of 1,800 traditional Chinese practitioners of Chinese cooking, Chinese martial arts and Chinese medicine plus a very small number of specified installers who are already able to work in Australia the question is, is that going to result in Chinese workers stealing Australian jobs? And the rational answer, the complicated, truthful answer, is no. That takes me to the Infrastructure Facilitation Agreement, the IFA. That is a memorandum of understanding that sits alongside the China FTA, and it's also relevant to the issue of labour market testing. The IFA would give Chinese companies registered in Australia the possibility, but not the guarantee, of using some foreign skilled labour, which would be paid under Australian conditions, but only in the event of an established and proven local skill shortage, which would otherwise hinder the completion of a large project. The IFA that is part of the China FTA is simply meant to provide certainty of access to a process a process that can, but will not necessarily, lead to the use of 457 visas. The only relevant change to the IFA that accompanies this China free trade agreement is that it lowers the investment project for the company that can go through this process from $2 billion, $2 billion down to $150 million. But again, this process scheme simply offers investor companies the certainty of a process. Investors are basically able to pre-negotiate with the Immigration Department an arrangement, a process, under which they may, they may be permitted by the Department to have temporary overseas, overseas skilled labour employed under a 457 visa. What the pre-negotiation does for a, for a large Chinese company on a large project is it alerts the Department of Immigration that contractors to the investment project may, at some future point, look to approach immigration at a time of peak labour, if there are labour shortages. And in the real world of very large projects, these are big projects that employ thousands of Australians and build infrastructure that would not otherwise be built in this country. Uh, in the real world of big projects, this pre-warning system gives the investor much greater confidence to invest and gives the Immigration Department advance notice of the possibility of future potential applications for 457 visas. 
nothing more than that. That is designed to make sure you don't have panicked applications for 457 visas on substantial projects if a labour shortage for domestic skilled labour arises. Non-Chinese companies facing a similar situation today can already approach the Immigration Department to bring in specialist skilled labour where there's a shortage on a 457 visa. Indeed, that avenue is already open to Australian employers, Australian companies, and crucially, the whole process is actually more stringent than what is known as labour market testing, i.e. requiring the company to advertise a job locally. And that is because under the IFA process, a company who wanted to use 457 visas during a skill shortage to finish the project has to show A, that there is a genuine and systemic shortage of skilled workers, B, that there are no suitably qualified Australian workers available, and C, that the project investor has an ongoing commitment to training Australians. Now, that complicated truth has not stopped simple lies and claims like this one, which came from the Australian Metal Workers Union New South Wales Secretary, Mr Tim Ayres. He said, this deal will mean that on a very ordinary construction project in our cities and our suburbs, it will allow the company to import Chinese workers at lower wages and conditions, denying young construction workers and young apprentices the opportunity for work. Now, that sounds terribly frightening. It is designed to be terribly frightening. The difficulty is it simply isn't true. The question is this. Will allowing the Department of Immigration to choose to test the existence of a skill shortage in a project over $150 million by requiring certain jobs to be advertised or giving the Department of Immigration the choice to test it by other more stringent investigative mechanisms, will that result in Chinese workers taking Australian jobs? The truthful, complicated answer to that question is rationally no, it will not. Scary claim number two is that unskilled and thereby dangerous Chinese tradespersons will be working in Australia. Now, an IFA requires Chinese companies to be registered in Australia and therefore to comply with all Australian laws and employment terms and conditions. So it is simply impossible to argue that anything in the infrastructure facilitation agreement process would allow an unskilled or dangerous trade person to work in Australia. There is a side letter to the agreement to the China FTA that does make one minor change and what it does is it reduces from 25 to 15 the number of skilled occupations which are subject to what is known as mandatory skills assessment. Now, these occupations include automotive electrician, cabinet maker, carpenter and electrician, amongst a few others. Now, the story here is that under Australia's general temporary skilled migration program, the thing that exists right here and now and has done for a long time, Skills assessment for overseas workers on 457 visas is not mandatory for workers coming from almost all the countries in the world and not mandatory for a whole range of skilled op occupations from those countries. So for most countries, the Department of Immigration has the discretion to rely on what lawyers would call evidence on the papers, such as your proof of qualifications. For only 25 occupations, for workers from 10 countries of the 195 countries in the world, it has there been a mandatory system? And the point has been that we are trying to decrease the people for whom we have a mandatory system and increase the people for whom we are able to make decisions, the Department of Immigration, on relevant, clear, registered papers. The 10 countries that there has previously been mandatory testing for are Brazil, China, which includes Hong Kong and Macau, Fiji, India, Papua New Guinea, Philippines, South Africa, Thailand, Vietnam and Zimbabwe. What this new side letter merely agrees to do is to move China from the list to the discretionary group in which most countries reside. So China, for 10 of 25 occupations, would move into the general list where the department exercises its discretion to test qualifications in the best manner that the department thinks applies at the relevant time. And let me then add on top of that this fact. As a final point on the skills issue, it has to be noted that skilled workers in Australia, tradespeople, wherever they are from, must go through skills testing to gain accreditation from state governments. 
That's the final safety net. So when I see someone like the Queensland State Trade Minister, Jackie Trad, complain about supposedly unskilled Chinese tradespeople being eligible for 457 visas, I ask the question, is she being mischievous or is she actually ignorant of the fact that her own state government is ultimately the responsible testing agency to guarantee appropriate skills for tradespeople working in that state? The question then becomes this. Will allowing the Immigration Department to accept documentary evidence of appropriate qualifications for 10 new categories of Chinese professionals, whilst always reserving the right for further scrutiny, will that result in unskilled and dangerous Chinese workers flooding into Australia? Again, the rational answer is no. I had a very disappointing day in Parliament where one of my colleagues from the Labor side of the House, Lisa Chesters, a, a new member of parliament who came into parliament with me in 2013, she said, and I'll quote her, you could call an electrician to come to your house and not know whether they have Australian qualifications and safety standards. That is absolutely preposterous. And to say it, just to scare people to try and affect an outcome, I think is a, is a great shame. Scary claim number three, there'll be all these Chinese workers with lower wages and conditions. There are no concessions available under the IFA on the need to pay market wage rates and comply with all workplace laws. For any 457 visa to be issued, the employer must pay market rates of pay with a minimum income threshold of $53,900 and they must meet all requirements under Australian workplace laws. There is simply no avenue through the infrastructure facilitation agreement for cheap Chinese workers. And on this point, it's notable that unions represent some of Australia's lowest paid workers themselves. The unions regularly use 457 visa workers. The United Voice Union employs nine people in its office on a 457 visa because they couldn't find the particular skills they needed at the particular point in time in the domestic marketplace and they were able to prove that to the Department of Immigration. Now, listening to the union campaign, you'd be forgiven for thinking that 457 visas is all about Chinese workers, that there are floods of Chinese workers on 457 visas. However, the total number of 457 visa holders from China in Australia is only 6% of the total. 6% of the total. Now, I would put to you all, and particularly uh, students studying here, that this debate that is raging around you is on the edge of becoming racist. And in fact, maybe putting to you that it's only on the edge of becoming racist is being generous to some of the things that are being said. The CFMEU National Secretary Michael O'Connor said point black that opposition to the China FTA, and these were her, his words, is, quote, about stopping greedy bastards trying to steal Australian jobs. And I'll leave it to you on a plain English translation to work out who he says the greedy bastards are. That is a statement that I think has crossed the line into, into an out-and-out racism. And I just put to you this question. Why is it that there has been bipartisan support for essentially and structurally the same types of free trade agreements with Japan and with South Korea, but there is a full-blown, highly moneyed, dishonest scare campaign reserved specifically for the China FTA? Why is that? even though it's essentially the same as the other two free trade agreements, and even though Chinese workers make up only 6%, 6% of all of the 457 visa holders and 457 visa numbers have been decreasing in Australia as the mining construction boom comes off because we don't have the same skilled labour shortage we did during the peak stages of the mining construction boom. One explanation might be the bulk of 457 visa holders choose not to be union members. That's their choice. I just think, in my observation, that emotion has overtaken reason in this area and overtaken rationality in this area. But I would say to you that all is not lost. There are very decent, rational Labor Party figures, men that I admire, with the nation's best and real interests at heart, who are resisting this union campaign, likely to their own personal detriment, Martin Ferguson, Simon Crean, Peter Beatty, John Brumby, Bob Carr and most recently Bob Hawke have all acknowledged how important the China FTA is to our future, as well as the present Labor Premiers, and more power to them and I admire them for it. That takes me on to the next point 
what does the China FTA do? And look, that is the boring part right over. That's the complicated detail that disproves simple lies. And I've found myself falling into the classic lawyer's trap of spending 15 minutes telling you what the agreement does not do. But you're not being charged for it, so relax. OK. <laughs> um, what, and the unions, I think, forced me into that. I had to do it. But the best way to explain what the China FTA will do for Australia is just by a few examples and facts. China is Australia's largest trading partner. It buys almost a third of all Australian exports, valued at nearly $108 billion. That was in 13-14. It is our top overseas market for agriculture, for resources and for services exports. Over 85% of Australia's export goods to China will enter duty-free under this FTA as soon as it enters into force. 85% duty-free into China as soon as it enters into force. That will rise to 93% of all of our exports being duty-free into China in four years and 95% when the agreement is fully implemented. And I should just note that tonight's speech focuses centrally on the China FTA, but that is the final of the trifecta with our three major trading partners. And when you look at those three FTAs, China, South Korea, Japan, with our three major trading partners, the modelling by the Centre for International Economics shows that these three new agreements will create thousands of jobs, make households, every individual Australian household's $4,348 better off a year, and boost GDP by $24.4 billion between 2016 and 2035. Together, those three agreements would account for more than 55% of our total goods and services exports. And of course, tonight, we're in the middle of the wheat belt, and there's one obvious area where Australia's comparative advantage is in rural industries and the export domestic employment and wealth generating opportunities for the people that are around us tonight and for the people studying here tonight are just absolutely staggering. Let me say to you that comparative advantage, Ricardo's theory, simply says that you don't have to be the best at anything to benefit from trade. You've just got to make sure that you concentrate your efforts on the things that you are best at. And the great gift that we face is that the things that we are best at are really highly prized and desired and demanded by what will be the biggest market in human history, which has arisen inside a decade right on our doorstep. That's the opportunity that we face and the challenge that we have. So in agriculture, you've got Chinese demand for high quality agriculture and food products, which is growing at an absolutely astonishing rate. ABARES predict that China will account for 43% of all global, global growth in agricultural demand by 2050. So out to 2050, all the new growth in demand, 43% of it will come from China. Until now, the absence of Australia having a bilateral FTA with China has meant that our producers and our exporters in agriculture have been at a very serious disadvantage compared to countries that do have an FTA with China, like New Zealand, like Chile and the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. The China FTA addresses this issue. It gives Australia a fantastic head start to penetrate this massive market, a head start over other players like the United States, like the European Union and like Canada, who are our natural competitors for this great market. So have a look at beef. The OECD assessed that beef will be the fastest growing import sector in China, Australian beef exports to China already set new records in 2013, totalling 161,000 tonnes, worth $787 million. Now, that was up from 93,000 tonnes. That means in one year, there was a 73% increase in beef traded into China, in one year, before the agreement's been signed and the tariffs come down. The FTA will eliminate tariffs on beef imports, which currently are between 12 and 25 per cent, down to zero in nine years. It will eliminate 12 per cent tariffs on beef offal, down to zero within four to seven years. The Meat and Livestock Association estimate an $11 billion boost to the meat and livestock industry out to 2030. Our red meat industry estimates benefits over the next 15 to 16 years of $3.3 billion. One point, that's to the beef industry, 1.8 billion to the sheep meat industry and 6 billion for sheep skin and hides. Dairy, 
China is the largest market for dairy exports in the world. Exports doubled recently to 443 million, before, even before the FTA was, was signed, imported wine into China. Australia is the third largest export market for wine and we're worth 201 million. However, our wine producers compete with New Zealand and they compete with Chile and both of those countries have had preferential wine access because they have already signed their FTAs with China. Chinese wine imports from Chile, so Chile signs an FTA with China, and Chinese wine imports from Chile increased sevenfold since that document was signed. The China FTA that we are about to sign and finalise would eliminate tariffs on bottled wine that are up to 20%, down to zero within four years. It would eliminate tariffs of up to 65% on other alcoholic beverages and spirits within four years, down to zero. Seafood. Australian seafood exports to China totaled 37 million in 2013. The China FDA eliminates tariffs on all Australian seafood exports and it does that over four years. So the agreement will create a huge opportunity for Australian seafood in the Chinese market. Since China and the New Zealand government signed their FTA, China's imports of seafood from New Zealand quadrupled. New Zealand do it four times more exports of seafood into China. I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, Fletcher International Exports, one of the largest meat exporters in the country, employs more than 1,200 people Australia-wide. Their director says the China FTA is the best move for the sheep meat industry in 20 years. He says in eight years' time when the agreement is in full swing, he expected to see a return to his business of about $150 million a year. Uh, in WA, the Birch family wines, they say the FTA with Korea, which we've already finalised, had an impact immediately upon announcement with a 50% increase on sales off the back of the Korea FTA. And they're gearing up for a move into China. Their CEO said the big prize for us is China. The government has created the opportunities, but now it's up to the individual businesses to do the hard yards. And of course, we're all interested in agriculture because it's around us, it's on our doorstep, it's the heart of our trading economy and it has been for 100 years. But it's not just the agricultural sector that stands to benefit. China's by, large, uh, by far our largest market for resources. We exported $90 billion worth of resources, worth of energy and manufactured products to China. And as soon as the FTA comes into force, 92% of Chinese imports of these types of resources and industrial products um, will be duty free and most remaining tariffs will be removed in four years. So on full implementation, 99.9% .9 of all our resources, all of our energy and all of our manufactured exports will be duty free into China. And then there's growth in all these industries you never would have expected. Pharmaceuticals, vitamins, health products. The China FDA eliminates tariffs from 10% down to zero in four years. Car parts, engines, plastic products, opals, precious stones. Elimination of tariffs on these and other manufactured products down to zero in four years. How about this one? Under the China FDA, the 10% tariff on caravans will be eliminated. Now apparently because of the one child policy, there's gonna be a lot of grey nomads in China who have a massive demand for caravans. And apparently it's something that we are showing a great comparative advantage in building, manufacturing and exporting. And just finally, uh, on this issue, for the, for the consumer generation, Gen Y, that you're all a part of, on top of all of these benefits, um, we, Australian consumers, will pay less for all of the household goods that we buy from China, electronics, clothes, and other goods that we regularly buy from China. This means that the China FTA is going to be the mother of all cost of living reduction policies. It will actually reduce the cost of living for everyone in this room. So this brings me to the third and final point. Um, what are the consequences if this agreement is not finalised? And at the moment, it is before the Senate. This union campaign is designed to have the Senate stop the completion of the China FTA. I would put to you tonight that the consequences of letting this agreement fall over are unimaginably awful. The National Farmers Federation says delay costs will be cost to rural communities alone. This is just the delay costs, not just the thing falling over delay, of $300 million worth of costs in 2016. Simply put, 
agriculture and a whole range of other Australian industries would continue to suffer as major competitors such as New Zealand get preferential treatment. Failure to ratify will cost the red meat industry 100 million, dairy up to 60 million and wine up to 50 million and grains more than 43 million. The industries that all sit around us where we are tonight. The coal industry says that for every week of delay in completing this agreement, it will cost the coal industry 4.6 million per week and it risks jobs as some of these mines are already on the edge of, of not having the markets they need. But the real tragedy, I think, should this China FDA fail in the Senate and not pass uh, into completion, is that we in Australia would stall or likely kill the growth in a whole range of new industries that could be the next big thing in Australian wealth generation and Australian job creation. So the Financial Services Council warns that if the China FDA is stopped, it would cost our economy more than $4 billion and almost 10,000 jobs in financial services. So for those of you studying um, financial services associated with agriculture, services that could be exported to places like China, Financial Services Council says that $4 billion and 10,000 jobs are at risk. And that's just financial services. There's lost opportunity for growth into a massive Chinese market with growing demand for all sorts of services. That would be a national tragedy. So perhaps the most critical point of all is simply that killing the China FTA would kill the growth of exports in service industries that could otherwise be the linchpin of our nation's economic future. And it just drives me mad when I see some, not all, but some of my Labor Party contemporaries on the one hand talk about innovation and technology and creating the jobs of the future and then stand on the precipice of killing the key agreement that would give real life to a whole range of future jobs in innovative service delivery and technical service delivery sectors. And if Australia is going to be a high skill, high labour cost economy and a high wealth nation, the services sector is where quality job growth of the future is going to come from. That is where jobs of the future will come from. And at the moment, services in the Australian economy are about 70% of our economy, but they make up, at best, about 20% of our exports. 70% of the economy, 20% of the exports. If we can lift that 20% of exported services up higher and higher, that is where the jobs growth for our future will come from. And the demand for services and the range of services that China will demand and that we could export to China is nearly limitless, probably limited only by the imagination of the generation sitting in this room. We in Australia have literally thousands of areas of expertise in services. Architecture, design, engineering, environmental services, transport, logistics, IT, tourism, hospitality, healthcare, aged care, education, vocational training. All of these things are things that we can export by way of services to China. And free trade agreements, along with the digital age and growing airport transport connectivity, provide a very cost-effective opportunity to expand Australian service businesses from a market of 23 million people at home into markets involving ultimately billions of people. So on this point, I just also note that China FTA offers what they call a most favoured nation clause. That clause effectively says that if at any point China gives a new deal to other countries, then we will get equal to the best deal going, including on services. So under the China FTA, China has offered Australia its best ever services commitments in any free trade agreement that China has signed with any international country. That means new or in significantly improved market access for Australian banks, insurers, securities, future companies, futures companies, law firms, professional services, suppliers, education service exporters, health, aged care, construction, manufacturing, telecommunications, service businesses, all of them would have new opportunities to export into China. And the opportunities, look, they're just simply staggering. For example, expenditure on healthcare in China this is what China will expend on their own health care with a very large population, is set to grow from 295 billion US dollars to a trillion US dollars in 2018. A trillion US dollars China will spend on its own population's health care. 
China, under this agreement, will permit Australian service suppliers to establish profit-making aged care institutions throughout China and wholly owned Australian hospitals in certain provinces. I mean, imagine the opportunities that that offers the services sector in Australia. This would greatly expand Australian private health sectors offering of medical services throughout East Asia and China. And one of Australia's most lucrative exports to China has been, of course, education. Uh, in June 2015, there were 124,000 Chinese on student visas in Australia. More than a quarter of the total of student visas were from China. And that is an export industry. We are exporting this, the service, it's just the students come here for that exported service. It's our largest source of international students and our largest source of tourism. So the simple fact is that even though China is Australia's largest services market, and it has been for a long time, the truthful point I'd make to you is that um, so far we've had exports and services valued at $7.5 last year, but that on an honest appraisal is something that we have to and must improve upon, and we will and can improve upon if this deal is landed. The China FTA lays the foundation for absolutely supercharged export in services into China. So by way of conclusion, my proposition to you tonight is just essentially a very simple one. And I think one that is provably true. The proposition is simply that trade can make us a wealthy, high employment, high wage nation. Trade is the key to that. And the evidence of this is everywhere. Recent quarterly growth Numbers in Australia show that of 0.9% quarterly growth in March, half of it came from net exports. So half of it came from trade. Half of our growth in the March quarter came from trade. If we hadn't been so active to date in liberalising trade and in attracting foreign capital, we would be a much poorer nation because of it. But right now, the union movement opposes free trade on the basis that it decreases jobs. I mean, I have not heard of anything so ludicrous. It is quite stunning, really, in how silly it is. Every single available fact shows that the China FDA would grow jobs enormously in this country for decades to come. Right now, today, one in five jobs in Australia is linked to trade. One in five. And we have a union movement trying to kill the most important trade agreement we, we, we have ever been on the verge of signing. And so if the central point is that trade is the path to future job creation, then I'd put to you that China is simply the future of trade. Australian exports to China now account for 6% of our GDP, 6% of our GDP. They are our la largest trading partner. They're worth $100 billion annually of trade to Australia. And that's more than all of our trade with the United States, Germany, UK, South Korea, France, Canada and all of Southeast Asia combined. You add all of that up, it still doesn't equal our trade to China. And at this moment, if you can wrap your heads around this, and sometimes I find it difficult to, at this moment, there are billions of people who live in India and China and in a few nations in between. Right now, 600 million of those people have converged onto the middle class. They live lives that we would very readily recognise. So of the billions between India and China, 600 million have converged into the middle class. The OECD estimate that within 35 years, not 100 years, not 50 years, in 35 years, between India and China, the people who will come into the middle class is three and a half billion people in the middle class. And they will demand the products that, that we demand, that we like. And we Australians have a great comparative advantage in those products. I mean, that three billion people that will converge into the middle class, that is an unprecedented economic phenomenon, just unprecedented in human history. That's an extra three billion people moving out of poverty and converging on the middle class. And China leads all of that growth in middle class consumer demand. Part of that's the rebalancing of the Chinese economy. Not that long ago, domestic consumption in China represented about a third of their GDP, and now it's getting up towards 50%. So you can see the demand of the middle class growing. 
And what is really critical for Australia is that Chinese consumers haven't just converged in ma massive numbers into a middle class lifestyle demanding our products. They, the Chinese middle class, have embraced online retailing more than just about any other country on earth. So online retail in China accounted for around 10% of all overall sales at the end of 2014, with spending, online spending, of half a trillion dollars last year. So that means that the Chinese online retail market is now larger than that of the US. The China online retail market is bigger than online purchases in the US. It's forecast to rise about 14% by the end of the year. By contrast, if you look at, look at Australia, online retail accounts for about 7% of sales in Australia. So hundreds of millions, billions of people moving to the middle class and they love online purchasing. So if the China FDA is confirmed, then never before has it been so easy for Australian business of all shapes and sizes across every manageable industry sector to reach an expanding market in China with products at competitive prices because we have comparative advantage in the products that the Chinese middle class desire. And we will have radically lower tariffs and be at a competitive advantage in that market if we sign this deal. Finally, look, there's a very pessimistic sentiment about modern politics, right, that politics is failing because political processes fail to produce outcomes that make our lives better and our families' lives better. The only reason I'm in politics is because I don't share that pessimistic view. I mean, I see the ability of modern politics to make our lives better, that the political process isn't broken. It can actually deliver results that make our lives better and make our futures better and make our children's lives better. And I don't think... I've ever seen a better example of that than the China FTA. It's the end of a decade-long political process that could revolutionise our economy and provide the ultimate gift of politics to people, that is the gift of wealth and jobs and the gift of those things to future generations. During the GFC, which we all experienced together, people talked about banks being too big to fail. Really? The China FTA is the example of something that's too big to fail. It is just too important for us to fail in the Senate. If after nine years and 21 rounds of negotiations, under the time of three governments, Liberal, Labor, Liberal, if it were now to fail in the, in the Senate at the 11th hour, I just put to you this, that that failure would be a national tragedy beyond comprehension. It would scar our economic development for generations. So look, again, I thank you all tonight for um, bearing with me. Um, I thank you for your time. I hope this evening's Muresk lecture has added modestly to the rational political discourse of good, decent Australian politicians on both sides of the political fence who cannot stand by silent while Bill Shorten and the union movement push the Senate to snatch defeat from the jaws of what could be one of our nation's greatest ever economic victories. Thanks again. Um, well, I'm sort of focused less on the timing, but more on the actuality. Like, I, we should not underestimate the notion that this agreement is now at risk. When you've got um, the union movement paying big money for big national advertising campaigns, they're doing that because they want it killed. They don't want it delayed, they want it gone. And, you know, as I say, that would be a massive tragedy. So, I mean, I think that what, what we're doing at the moment... Um, my side of politics and, as I say, these luminaries of the Labor movement. I mean, you, you read what Bob Hawke says about how critical this agreement is to our future. Um, what these people are doing is trying to make the political process work to produce the result. So, to me, it's existential in its actuality. Like, is this thing going to happen? Um, and we'll know soon enough, but we should be under no illusions that there are very strong parts inside Labor, not all of Labor, but strong parts that are trying to do a deal with the crossbenchers to stop this thing from going through the Senate. 
So, you know, delay is bad, but failure is unimaginably terrible. Yes, Christian, you mentioned in your speech about India. Mm. How close or are you working with India in terms of FTA? Yep. Uh, well, so Andrew Robb, who I think is a great unsung hero of our government, as I said, 55% of all of our exports go to South Korea, Japan and China, and, and you know, we're about to land the, th the third of that trifecta. And then, of course, the next big one is India. So Andrew Robb has spent a lot of time in India. In fact, Andrew Robb spends no time in Australia, from what I can see. I mean, he, tr he travels enormously. So he's confident that, that that deal can come to fruition. But looking back on the China FTA, I mean, it's a decade. So these things are very hard to hammer out because both sides want to be mutually advantaged. Uh, and Andrew Robb, as he said consistently, he wouldn't have produced a deal for Parliament that puts us at any disadvantage. You know, th this is a deal which is overwhelmingly to our advantage, but they do take a long time to hammer out. Um, and a lot of that's to do, when you actually look at the deal, all of the products where there are tariffs, 10 15%, 25%, bulk wine, you know, 60%, um, there are just thousands of these products. And all of them in China and Australia, there are sensitivities in the industry and we have to bring the industries along and everyone has to be content, um, or at least not too discontent. Uh, so they're very complicated, but um, if anyone can do it, Andrew Robb can. He's been absolutely amazing. I might also say, Craig, with pork, which I know you export a lot of, China is, is oddly enough, the biggest exporter and importer of pork in the world. But also, they're a massive importer of pork because their middle class now prefer the product that, that I know that, that you produce and that others in Australia produce because it's, it's of a quality beyond anything else that exists anywhere in the world. So, I mean, even for things that China is comparatively big producer of, their middle class consistently and growing, in growing numbers demands high quality product, which is what we do amazingly well. And it's going to be high quality product, not just in pork, but in healthcare and architectural services. Yeah, I completely agree with everything you're saying with the FTA agreement. <coughs> if we're going to capitalise on the growth in China, we definitely need it. And it seems like Australians are going to have more jobs in China than Chinese are going to have in Australia. So how are the Labor government, government arguing that we're going to lose jobs? And surely they must have more arguments than that if they're trying to push it for not to work. Um, this, look, the, as I said tonight, the central argument is just basically that low-skilled, low-paid, dangerous Chinese workers will flood into Australia and take jobs. I mean, that's the argument. And as I say, um, because you are all young and optimistic and haven't seen the horrors of politics that I have up close, the reality is that sometimes simple lies get traction. And there's something which isn't, I don't think, deep in the West Australian psyche about Chinese workers, because we've been a trading nation, trading state for 100 years. But what, what some parts of the Labor movement are trying to do is tap into a psychology um, that may exist out there. I, I hope and pray it doesn't. Um, but that kind of xenophobia and, I think, outright racism at some points is very unhappy and healthy. So if you're putting to me, it doesn't look like a very strong argument, I absolutely agree with you, but we should all be very careful of things that don't look like technically strong arguments, because sometimes emotional arguments, um, they hook in and we have to be very careful of them. And that's why lectures like tonight uh, and getting out and speaking with people one-on-one -on -one is a very important thing. And if you're in a coffee store and someone says to you, you know, China is going to take our jobs, it's, it's worth reading online what's going on and, and informing yourselves. Well, um, I think that one of the things that I've found... Um, so I'm Generation X and I married a Generation Y. And um, I've learned a lot about Generation Y, but Generation Y is the choice generation. So a fundamental, I think, basic underpinning philosophical bent of my side of politics is that people should be unencumbered within reason uh, in their choices and that government shouldn't impose government's view about the best choice on people. Um, 
In practical terms, what does that look like in terms of what comes to China to Australia and what Australia sends to China? Yes, I mean, if you go down to Coles and Woolies, there, are, there is Chinese agricultural produce available, unquestionably, as there is from Mexico and a whole range of other countries. It very often is that produce as good a quality as the Australian produce. No, it's not. But I guess the answer to it is that produce is already here uh, and Australian consumers already make their decisions. And those decisions are not decisions we should be frightened of because Australians do choose Australian produce in, in huge numbers. Technically, what has happened with the China FTA is that, it, that the sticking points have very often been around um, certain manufactured goods like automotive, automotive manufactured goods. And of course, because we have not had a comparative advantage against South Korea and China in the manufacture of SUVs, that is an industry which has fallen into decline in Australia. But the point about the agreement is that we will likely be buying more things from China. Automotives will be one of them. But the flip side is that allowing our products to have access in China, they will be buying more things from us. And this gets back to what David Ricardo said. He said it can be proven mathematically as, an, as a provable truth every time that if you focus on the things that you are comparatively better at in your own economy and trade with other countries who do the same thing, everyone benefits. It is the classic end to the zero sum game where someone's got to lose. So in answer to your question, yep, we'll be buying more of their stuff, they'll be buying more of our stuff and everyone will be wealthier. No, the Foreign Investment Review Board rules remain the same, and in fact, um, you know, we've we've had some tightening of those rules under this under this government um, with respect to both residential land and also with respect to when reviews on on other land have been conducted. But the way in which the FTA um, can facilitate investment is in larger projects, particularly construction projects. So what, what all experts generally agree on in the field in Australia is that we have an infrastructure deficit. Uh, we simply, as a nation that's always relied on foreign capital to help us build infrastructure, we need more and better infrastructure. So uh, in reality, it doesn't change the lay of the land terribly much in terms of the attractiveness of agricultural investment in Australia. There are intangibles about deepening bonds of trust and, and commercial understanding between the two nations that flow from the FTA. But I'd just put to you that probably really the big advance in terms of better and more productive foreign investment in Australia is with respect to large scale construction projects because of the, limit, the previous limit of $2 billion for streamlining processes with the Department of Immigration. We're giving more confidence to construction investors uh, at $150 million and above. So, there will still be continued investment in agriculture. We've tightened the rules around some of that, um, properly so. Uh, but this agreement, I think, produces more incentives in the construction area. Okay. You mentioned that uh, part of the Labor movement, at least, is opposed to the free trade agreement. But what sort of support or otherwise are you seeing from the independents in the Senate? Yeah, well, it's very tricky. Um, I, don't know if you've, I don't know if you've met Jackie Lambie. It's sort of hard to know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's... It, there is a volatility around um, the, the crossbenchers in the Senate. I mean, what, what I think would be best here is if the Labor Party supported this and we weren't relying on what are the most eclectic group of crossbenchers that people can conceive of in recent political history. I mean, good, decent members, men and women in the, in, in the Australian Labor Party, they know the truth of this. Now, certain union supporters of some of those people might be putting pressure on them, but the best result here is if Australia, the Australian Labor Party does what Bob Hawke um, says they should do, which is support the agreement. Thank you, Mr. Porter. It's been a very long day, I'm sure. Um, one point I picked up in yours, and this is probably a comment that you may wish to respond to, I guess, is the notion of the Senate being able to make the decision that the Labor Party has been making for decades. I mean, Yeah, that, I didn't say that. The <laughs> journalist said that, but yeah. Yeah, I know it's a yeah. journalistic license there. But I guess I can't recall.
recall whether it was in this article or not, but, but our Prime Minister made a claim that in Australia our cost of doing business due to regulation ranked somewhere between, and I can't quote the nations and I can't quote the numbers, but it was yep. between Botswana and Uganda yep. and, and so on, and you know, we needed that there in relation to your job. At the time I thought, gee, that's, a, that's an interesting claim to make, so I tried to have a look for it, I googled it as you might, yep. and um, the closest thing I could find was the ease of doing business, the World Bank Index of the ease of doing business yep. in the countries. Now, whether it was Botswana and Uganda, I couldn't be sure, but they ranked something in the vicinity of 146 and 173, respectively, and Australia ranked number 10. I guess what I'm saying is that one of the features of modern politics for me is quite extravagant claims by all sides. And it's, it's we, we hear a talk like tonight and we think, yes, you know, it's, it's great, you've just very eloquently presented a range of very plausible claims and so on. But then other things like that come up and I just find it disappointing when it comes from both well. sides of politics that we have that same sort of uh, My wife hates this, but I carry around more useless factoids in my head than, than most people. The, the, the figure, uh, the data that you're citing, is this. The Economist Intelligence Unit does a ranking of 51 comparative nations on a thing called multi-factor productivity. Multi-factor productivity is the growth in a certain measure of productivity. Labour productivity is just how much more productive can every worker in Australia be, which usually depends on investment in capital and technology. Multi-factor pro productivity says if you hold the amount of labour and capital constant, how do you increase productivity? So it's a measure of, of um, innovation, managerial innovation, deregulation, those types of things. And what the Economist Intelligence Unit did in the final year of Labor 2012 was they measured our growth on this very important index, which most economists say accounts for about 60% of all economic growth. And of the 51 nations, on the growth in multi-factor productivity, we came second last. And we were, I think last was either Uganda or Botswana from memory. So the point being this is that we have generally had quite good productivity growth because we, this government, previous governments, this government is investing billions of dollars in infrastructure to grow labour productivity. But if you can't get multi-factor productivity growth, like the magic in an economy, the deregulation, the innovation, the managerial systems, if you can't get that fired up and multi-factor productivity growing, then um, you, you will really, in the long run, fall down the tables of international productivity. And productivity growth is a problem in this country. So it's definitely, I think, what you're talking about is multi-factor productivity. What happens with politicians, though, is that we will give quite often detailed explanations of things and the journalists will... No offence, but, I mean, the journalists will, <laughs> will put that through the filter. And so, I mean, the average... If I close by saying for, you know, if your students here, the, the average press conference that the Prime Minister or the Premier that you had here last year gives will be, you know, somewhere between five and 30 minutes. And what you see on TV is 5.6 seconds, which is the average grab. So sometimes a little bit is lost in that massive condensation. But, um, yeah, that is, that is a true fact. Trust me. <laughs> um, I would like to say thank you to the Honourable Christian Porter for talking to us tonight about the China Free Trade Agreement and the impacts it will have on our future and our nation as a whole.